Proverbs 18. And, uh, you know, the only thing I will say, my wife and I, you know, you guys have been very gracious. Pastor Thompson and Miss Sherry have been wonderful. And uh, even today, we just took a little time during the day, and we went out to, uh, we were trying to see some falls. I don't know what they're, but, uh, some falls out about 20 miles from here. My wife knows all the names, but it was raining. But the only thing we noticed on the way back, we kept looking for, like, things about Sam Houston and Davy Crockett. Everything was about Lewis Clark and who are they? I'm just, I'm just kidding. You know, when we're in Texas, everything's just bigger and better, right? That's what you hear. And so we also, that's how we treat our, you know, our, our history too. I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, I know who Lewis and Clark are. And so they're your neighbors. I'm just kidding. But um, go over to Proverbs 18. And the title of the message this evening is For Life. And it's actually a play on words. I'm going to give you four things that you, we need to focus on in marriages, but also because marriage is for life. You know, one of the things that we don't consider, we shouldn't consider when we go into marriage is that the D word, right? We should never think of divorce. Yeah, right. We know that it's biblical. The Bible actually instructs us that divorce is not a biblical concept. We don't, it's not a doctrine that we believe in. But the challenge is society has sold us on that, that fact. Society has given us more excuses to get divorced than we could ever want. You know, people get divorced for some of the dumbest reasons, and, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about that here. But if you just, right there in Proverbs 18, 22, you know, I think this is one of my favorite verses because when I got married, this is the verse that really gave me peace about, you know, being the man of the house and taking care of your wife and raising a family. It says, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. And, I mean, it really is a good thing to be married. And it is a good thing to find favor in the Lord. But the challenge is that we've been so brainwashed to believe the opposite, right? I mean, we've been brainwashed to believe that if a, a wife doesn't carry her weight in the, in the workforce, then maybe she's not, you know, a good help meet. When the reality is the Bible teaches something different. Then we're also being taught that, you know, when you start having children, they're really more of a burden, you know, so something cool to have. They're like an accessory. 2.5 kids, that's what we want to have. Maybe a dog, if you want to, a cat. And the reality is that's not what the Bible teaches us at all. And so we're just going to focus on a couple things that we want to sure up. And I actually didn't make, the, didn't make that a play on words, but we're going to sure up these things because these are the things that cause divorce in marriages. And you know where divorce is rampant is in, in the Christian lifestyle. It, you know, it's in the Christian churches today because people aren't preaching the truth like they need to be preaching the truth. One of the things I really appreciate about churches like Sure Foundation is that you're going to hear the truth. And it's not always fun. You know, um, I appreciate the fact that you, you preach on the hard stuff. And I'm not just talking about the hard stuff like the sodomites and, you know, false doctrine or dispensation, you know, all these things that we know about, but also the hard stuff like, hey, husbands, love your wives. You know, wives, be submissive to your husbands. These are important things that God has asked you to do. You know, wives shouldn't be submissive to their husband, not just because that's what the Bible says, but because you want to serve God. You want to obey God. You want to do, you, you want to have a healthy fear of God. You know, I, I think that my wife is a great help me to me. And what I love about my wife being a good help me to me is that she loves Christ. Amen. You know, I, I'm, that's probably the only thing I'll tell you in over time you, you guys will learn. And because uh, I don't want to waste too much time. We've got a, a short sermon here today. But, you know, when I finally decided I wanted to get married, you know, I, I knew she was the one. We were, you know, my, my in-laws didn't like me very much, you know, so it was, it was kind of a contentious thing. They love me now. As a matter of fact, my kids are with uh, my in-laws. You know, they love the kids, and they love my wife. They love me. But I remember I was willing to fight for her and overcome those challenges, and I remember cornering her, and I said, look, I said, I need to know that you love Christ more than me because I love Christ more than you. And I remember when she said that, I was like, well, then if, you, if that's what you really believe, then you're the one. And I remember, remember like it was this day, and I remember that's what made me say, that's, that's what I'm going to fight for no matter how long it takes. Because my, my father-in-law made me wait like six months before I could even talk to him again about, you know, approaching his daughter. And I'll tell you stories about that later. It was, uh, it was fun. I mean, literally, our marriage was like forged in the fires of, <laughs> of my in-laws, you know. So, I mean, it was tough, but, you know, but it's... But, you know, you want to do things right. You want to obey the Lord because it's so sweet to have in-laws that love you. They've been so great through all our challenges, and they support us, and they back us. But you want to have a foundation 
that's based on Christ. You know, a good marriage isn't because it's good because you built it right. It's because it's built on Christ. So, you know, I'm going to go through, through. You guys can keep up with me if you want. But if turn over to 1 Corinthians 14. I'll just read for you real quick in Genesis. You know, and this message is for couples, uh, you know, but these are the things that we, but we must address things in order, right? The husband is the head of the home. Therefore, the leadership is the crucial in these points that I'm going to talk about, right? The challenge I think today is the reason that I believe feminism exists and I believe that you have a lot of this misinformation, even with all the, the topics that I just addressed, is that men aren't doing their jobs. I really think that that's the downfall of society. We, we could blame all the feminists of today. You know, we can pick on Hillary Clinton. We can pick on, you know, uh, AOC. I don't even know her name. The, the, you know, she, she gives Hispanics a bad name, but we can pick on all of them. But the reality is she probably didn't have a strong father. You know, you think about that. There was, Bill Clinton's not a good leader. You know, if you, if you, I mean, I'm just, let's, 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 let's point to the facts. But Genesis 3.16 says, Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception and sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. The reason we need strong leadership is because women are looking for leadership. The Bible tells us that their desire shall be to their husbands. And then it says, what does it say? And he shall rule over thee. But too many, too many times today, men are afraid to take leadership. Right, yeah. You know, when you rule, it's not just about cracking the whip. It's also about having a little bit of grace and mercy. Yeah, yeah. Right? I mean, you think about it. I was just preaching this Wednesday at church about Jonah, you know, and, and you think about how much grace and mercy God had on Jonah. I mean, talk about someone who had a bad attitude, right? We're not, I'm not preaching that sermon, but that's how we should be with our wives. You know, you want to lead, but all you want to do is bark orders. Well, that's not always going to get the job done, right? I mean, you've got to lead, and you've got to be a good uh, leader. In Hebrews 13, 4, the Bible says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. And what really stood out to me in this verse is, it didn't say whores. It said whoremonger. Because the, the duty is of the man. You know, it's our duty to lead our wives. It's our duty to lead in society. It's the duty of Pastor Thompson to lead this church. Right? I mean, we know Christ is the head of the church, but who's leading the church? And, and there's all these reasons. You probably have heard them. I'm not going to go through all of them, but we know women tend to be more emotional. And that, that actually is a good quality in the home. You want them, right? Because we're not, as guys, we're not always so nurturing to our, our kids. Sometimes I just don't have the patience that my wife has with the kids, you know? I mean, the first thing I want to do is just discipline and silence. I've got things to do. I've got work to, you know, let's, let's go on to the next thing. But she's more, you know, maybe, maybe you should not, Daddy, you know, don't, don't do that. Or just let me handle it first. Let me see if I can calm him down. And I'm just like, no, 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 let me just get this done. And I've got work to do. I've got other things to do. So, but here's, I went to six websites. And these are just four. I have four points for you today. I went to six websites. So I want to make sure that I had my, my facts straight about the top reasons for divorce. And this is between 2019 and 2021, so it'll fluctuate. And, and then I, I went and I just put all the top four reasons, and I, I made sure I had them all, and then just kind of where they fell. And you had things like lack of commitment, infidelity, lack of intimacy or love, marry too young, lack of commitment, differences. You know, you're going to see, you, so they start to repeat themselves. Money, uh, marry too young, emotional abuse infidelity, they argue too much, not enough communication. And what really stood out is at the end, I ended up with, you know, four major points or four things that just kind of, they all come, it's all the same thing, right? They name them different. And the number one thing, I actually thought it was money. That's really where I started on this journey. I was like, well, I'm going to preach about marriage. Money's probably the, the main reason people get divorced. That's actually what I was thinking. So I'm looking, doing this research, and it's actually worse than that. Because you would think money's actually from a world's point of view, you can understand that, right? The woman wants that security. Maybe the guy's lazy or vice versa. But the really the number one reason people get divorced is lack of communication, you know, lack of commitment. Those are the two main, because you can transpose them either. Someone who's not committed is not communicating, right? And someone who's not communicating is not committed. And that's the number one reason. And the reason that, that uh, I think that happens, and that's why I started with the men is, the men are instructed to teach in the home, yeah. Yeah. just like the pastor is instructed to be apt to teach in the church. Yeah, right. 
right? And if you go to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34, it says, let your women keep silence in the churches. And we don't, you know, this is not a popular verse that's preached in modern churches today. I'm not talking a church like this because it, it's hard to preach because you, you get the glaring eyes from women. But men need to be men and forget that, you know, you know, you know how you get a wife to follow you? You have to overcome the glaring looks, right? Because wives will give you glaring looks. You're going out in that shirt? Yeah, I'm going out in that shirt. Are you, are you really, you know, did you like my cooking? No. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you have to say the truth, right? I mean, how else are you going to get communicated? Or I love your cooking. You're lying to me. No, I'm not lying to you. I really do like your cooking. I mean, these are the things that we have to struggle with. But it says, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience. As also saith the law, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So, man, you need to learn some Bible in order to teach your wife and your children. Because, see, people love to preach this because, you, know, it's, it's, it, you know, if you're young, I see a lot of young men that, that write on Facebook about how they want to find a godly woman and they want to rule over her. And I keep, the only thing I keep thinking to myself is, man, you better know some stuff because yeah. <laughs> leading those waters are some interesting waters to lead in your life, right? We're going on 10 years of marriage. And the one thing I learned is I still don't know everything about my wife. You know, and I love my wife, and we have great times, but we have th th things that we have to work through no matter what. You know, if you, uh, you don't have to turn there for the sake of time. If you guys want to go to Matthew for the next point, but I'm just going to give you some verses. In Ephesians 5.22, the Bible says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands, as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And I'm not, I mean, I know it feels like I'm preaching to the men, but it's only natural. Look, if you guys become the leaders, your wives are going to submit. Your wives are going to learn, and your wives are going to love you back. Because the Bible instructed us in Genesis, that's part, of the, that's part of the package. They want you to rule over them. They want you to lead them. Their desire is for, the, for their husband. You know, one of the things that, that uh, you know, these are things, just things that stand out in our marriage that, that I think about. You know, we never talked about having a, like, separate or the same bank account. It was just a given that, that's, that I was going to just lead the finances. I never asked her for permission, and she prefers it that way so that she doesn't have to worry about all that stress, right? But you've got to just take that leadership. It's not, there's no committee for some of the things that you need to do in your, in your marriage life. You know, maybe you can discuss things, but if you have a committee, you're going to get a bunch of opinions. Right. You know, if Pastor Thompson got up here and asked what color he thought the church should be, it would not be blue. It would be all kinds of colors because everybody has an opinion. It, would, it really would. And I mean, churches break up over that stuff, and you know what? Marriages do too. I had a friend of mine who actually ended up dating my sister, and she knows. I mean, I'm not, but he ended up dating my sister. He was my best friend for 10 years through college, and he, he sat there and told me that God told him that he needed to get divorced. And the reason that he got divorced from his wife was because she wouldn't iron his clothes and make him his lunch. I mean, the, the things that people, these are the excuses people look for to end up doing something else, but, you know, I don't, I don't blame the, I mean, I blame him for his actions, and I called him out for that, but what I'm trying to say is I blame him for not being a man. These are just the consequences that came from it. Because actually what happened is they got counseling. She already had come to terms with the fact that she needed to step up. But it was too late. He, what he was looking for was a way out. But the reason is because he never went and committed. He was never willing to communicate. You know, it was always just a ploy. Uh, the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 3, 2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. And you're like, what does this have to do with with a sermon. I thought it was interesting because I kept thinking, you know, one of the things we have to do as men in our homes is to teach, right? And as a bishop, you have to be apt to teach. But if you go over to 2 Timothy 2.22, and you don't have to turn there for the sake of time, we see that word again, apt to teach. And now Paul's just reiterating this to Timothy, but no longer in the context of just the bishop. He's just saying, this is just a general, let me just give you some general knowledge. And he says there in 2 Timothy 2.22, says, flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, 
faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strives. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patience. And so we see that this is a pattern that applies as much to the, the, the preacher, but it applies to the home too. Man, you need to be apt to teach. And you know, God gave you the family you have for a specific reason, right? The analogies I use on my children might not be the analogies you would use on your children. But your children are going to understand you. You know, my, my dad and my mom, did, we weren't raised in the church, but one of the things I appreciate about my dad, he spent a lot of time teaching me things. And I remember those conversations. I remember learning about the theory of relativity with my dad and learning about, you know, just basic tool uses, like how to use a hammer and how to use a screw and how to use these things. And he would use these analogies, and they were always long and drawn out. And he, but that's the way that I learned. He knew that, right? But he was apt to teach in that respect. Now, it would have, like everything, right? You could always say, if I could go back, I wish he would have been a, go a godly man who could teach me these things. But that foundation of being a man was what it was able to help me reach the ability to understand, oh, the Bible's true, because now I had cognitive reason. You know, I could reason things and figure out, oh, okay, well, I learned how to learn. I wasn't just spewing out something that the school system was right. teaching me. Amen. And so we have to learn to teach. And teaching isn't multiple choice. Teaching is actually applying the things that you learn. Right. There's stuff in here that is hard even sometimes for us to teach. And so I, it's, it's not like you have to know everything, but you just got to study it out and teach your wives how to do these things. Yeah. You know, I wish I could go into all the examples of just you hear women spew out some interesting stuff sometimes. And then you're like, well, where are the guys clearing this up for them? You know, when it comes to doctrine, I'm not, well, let's not get into that because, you know, <laughs> then the wives will start, well, I hear some stuff from them. So this is not one of those sermons. <laughs> but the second thing that, uh, and then these three, so teach hath the most, right? I mean, the, I'm sorry, uh, lack of communication commitment, this like was all over the place in the four, in the six websites I did. And then the other three, they all had a tie. The, the three are money, youth and infidelity but what i want to what i want to focus on is when it comes to the money and when it comes to the youth and when it comes to the infidelity and this is basically your final point is guard your heart guard your heart you know and i i, I was listening to pastor uh because uh, I, I i he's been a good friend so i actually wanted to see what he thought about friendship so i listened to his sermon on friendship which by the way you ought to listen to but one of the things he he brought up is uh you know, uh, Proverbs 4 about the issues out of the heart, you know, guard your heart because out of there are the issues, and I'm butchering it, but the reason it stood out is that's the verse that my mom would call me about when I was a young man. She's like, read this verse, read this verse. She always was telling me to read that verse, and just, it, it's interesting that some things that stood out to a mother about raising a young man, yeah, that verse just always uh, popped up, but you know, you're there in Matthew 6, but Proverbs 21 verse 9 says, it is better to dwell in a corner of a housetop than with a brawling woman in a white house. If you've ever been married, this verse makes sense to you. <laughs> and by the way, you guys are married, right? I mean, this verse makes the most, it, the Bible is so great. You know, I mean, we don't have to go into specifics. I love that you don't have to confess your sins to everybody. You've married, you, you know what this verse means. And as a man, you got to get to the first part, right? You want to reach the, it is better to dwell in a corner of a housetop than with a brawling woman in a white house. Because, you know, it, you, when you're leading your wife, there's a difference between an argument, but if you get her to the point where she blows up, you're going to have to just wait out, right? Don't do that. You just don't, don't get there. I'm just being honest with you. Because that's where you lose that battle. You can't teach someone that's... And that applies to your children. That even applies to you. That applies to church members. That applies to your friends. Once you get past that point... You're not getting anything across. You know, my, once somebody's lost it, forget trying to, you know, get reasoning, show them a verse. Don't, don't come to your wife after she's lost it. I'll be like, this verse, honey, right here. Right here. This is a, that's not going to help anybody, you know. Don't come. I, I, I joke around with my wife all the time. I'm like, honey, you should call me Lord. You know, it's Abraham. It's Sarah called Abraham Lord. Don't do that in the heat of a battle. You know, just joke around. And like, don't do it in the heat of a battle. But, you know, this... Uh, but in Matthew 6, 19, what does the Bible tell, tell, tell us? It says, Lay not up for yourself treasures on, upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, 
But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth, moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And I know we hear this verse a lot, but let's really apply it. Look, it's real easy to get caught up with the Joneses. And you as a man have to be not emotional and lead your wife, because women like shopping. They do. And I mean, you say, what does that have to do with anything? One thing is shopping, the other thing is just trying to compete. You know, I grew up in a Hispanic home. I grew up with women that love to shop. Mary, you know, when my wife went down and we lived for a few months in the valley, she was like, what's up with Hispanic women down here? They look like they're gonna go to the prom every day. You know, but you end up spending money. I mean, seriously, and so what ends up happening is you get into financial woes. You know, you, and women, it's real easy. If, if, if your man or your husband is leading you, then it's easy for you to be chased. You know, you don't spend as much money if you're not spending money on makeup and fancy clothes. And husbands, love your wife the way she is. You know, compliment her. Let her know that she doesn't need to have a Louis Vuitton or drive a Mercedes or whatever else, you know, the, the Joneses are doing. Proverbs 30, verse 8 says, Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with, feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of God in vain. Look, we do, as men, it's real, it's real easy to get caught up in the rat race. Yeah. But just, just be happy that God provides. Amen. And I can talk from experience in that because I actually went and became an investment advisor. You know, I mean, I, I drove the nice car in my life. I've had the $1,000 boots. You know, I've spent the money on all that. And it's all vanity. It means nothing. It doesn't, but if you focus on the right things, God will provide, and you know what it does is it gives you a happier home. Because right, as men, if you're focused on the wrong thing, you know what's gonna end up happening? You're gonna lose that battle. The money battle is a serious battle in marriage. But as men, you've got, and I've heard stuff. I mean, my, uh, I've had family members, and you know, in the Hispanic culture, it's very common for the wife to lead the finances, and then that's where divorce happens because men don't want to take responsibility for the administrative side of a marriage. You know, there's an administrative side to the marriage and it's not a fun side. Staying up at night, running your numbers, especially if you're not good at math, thank God for Excel, right? I mean, seriously, I'm not, if I didn't have Excel, I'd be up for hours at night trying to figure stuff out. But you've got to get things in order. You've got to do that. You've got to take care of your finances. You've got to lead your wife and you've got to show her why you're not gonna be able to buy her that Louis Vuitton, but it's okay, because you're gonna be able to take care of another, another aspect. And I don't know why I said Louis Vuitton, that's probably the only name brand I know, that's why. <laughs> but uh, Proverbs 15, 16 says, better is a little with fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. You know, some of my sweetest memories and I'm pretty sure a lot of you have them, is when we first got married, in the struggle. I remember sitting down and you, you, know, you eat on a box and you're just eating ramen and you think that's the greatest thing, you know, because you're in love and it's the honeymoon. But those are the sweet memories, but you've got to keep that going 10 years later. And that's where it requires activity, it requires action, because it's not always feeling. You know what, I don't always feel love, but I know I love my wife. Does that make sense? Yeah. And let me clear that up. It's that, not that I don't love my wife, but I don't like the, the feeling of love. I like knowing that I love my wife. Because the feeling of love is just fake. You know, all those butterflies and that, that, like that teenage stuff. That doesn't do any, that doesn't solve anything. That doesn't pay any bills. That doesn't change any diapers. <laughs> doesn't clean up any throat. It doesn't, right? Yeah. People are like, oh, me and my wife, we're, we're perfect. I'm like, yeah, then you need to get in a fight. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm not, I'm not kidding. And you say, well, that doesn't sound very... Look, fights are going to happen. You, the Bible says, for all have sinned. So don't come to me and tell me you've never been in a fight with your wife. You be, then you're lying. <laughs> now we got another doctrinal issue, right? What does John say? I mean, just... And then let me just finish off with uh, these two because I, I don't want to over... I did start a few minutes. So I'm, just, I'm just giving myself some time. But the other one that I saw that really threw me off, and I'm actually against this... Um, is it says that they got married too young. And I'm against that because I actually think you should get married young. Yeah. And you say, and I, and I can speak also from experience there because I got married when I was 31. And 
I'm not here, I'm not one of those preachers. I'm gonna tell you everything that, that I did bad in my life, but I made mistakes in my life that I probably wouldn't have made if I got married young. Now, God has a perfect plan for everybody. I didn't get saved till I was older in life, so I'm glad I'm, you know, I got married when I got married. But the reality is, I also wouldn't have made some of the mistakes that I made in my life, honestly. And I would have grown up a lot quicker than if, if I would have gotten married young because men don't grow up until they get married. That's the reality of things. Because I was living the high life. You know, I had a career. I had a nice car. You know, I had money in my pocket. You know, I was always looking good or, you know, good according to the world. There's no, there's no maturity there. So to be honest with you, for me, that's important because the Bible is, instructs us and says in Proverbs 5.18, it says, let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. And what's going on today in society? People are getting married later in life. You know, another statistic I saw that stood out, and I'll stay there in Proverbs 5, it said that marriage, uh, the divorce is in decline. What they didn't say is why is it in decline? It's not because all of a sudden Baptist preachers got up and we're changing the tide, even though we, I think, believe we are, but we're not changing it that much. It's because people are cohabitating, and they're living together more and more, and they're just living together longer. That's a whole other set of problems that we would just won't have time to touch today. But, you know, cohabitation is destructive. Yeah. Look, if, you're gonna, if you feel like you need to live together, just get married. Amen. And, I mean, I go around telling everybody, oh, you guys, are t just get married already. I don't even care who's in the room. Just get married. You know, if you're really serious about each other, just, well, I don't know if I have enough money. You never have enough money, let me tell you that. <laughs> you never have enough time. Amen. You never have enough sleep. You never have enough everything. I mean, and the one thing that's consistent about, I, I believe that's why it says, you know, rejoice with the wife of thy youth is because the older you get, the harder life gets. And I'm not being negative. It's just the reality of life. I wish somebody would actually told me that a long time ago, yeah. right? right? There's more problems. People backstab you more. People treat you worse. You have less friends. So you better have a good friend. I mean, your wife should be your best friend because sometimes that's the only friend you have. Right. You know, I mean, when... You know, I just recently went through some really tough times with my business. The only one that was there for me was my wife. Not even my parents. They couldn't be. They didn't understand what was going on. I mean, if I didn't have her with me, I don't know what I would have done. You know, she was there with me, fixing all the things that we, I couldn't fix, dealing with all the issues. It was emotional. It was hard. Thank God I had my wife. Amen. The wife of your youth. And so it's, uh, verse 19 says, Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee all, at all times. And be thou ravished always with her love. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of sins. He shall die without instruction, and in the greatness of his folly he shall go astray. The reason I read that is because that leads me to the final point. Another reason people get divorced is infidelity. And it also falls on the guys. You can blame the woman all day long. But look, it says, well, infidelity is rising in women. I was reading one statistic. Well, you know why it's rising in women? Because they're in the workforce. Yeah. And you know, I don't know if you've ever been around a worldly work environment, but men don't care that the woman's married. Yeah. Right? They don't respect that. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I don't bring my wife around any, any worldly people. Because men don't respect that. Then I'd have to be in a fight all the time, and I'd be disqualifying myself. Men don't care. <laughs> Worldly men don't care. You know, I've heard stupid stuff like, oh, well, I don't care. I'm not jealous. You know, I'm not jealous that you're married. I, I don't, I've heard stupid stuff like that. That's how the world acts. And you know what? Women are seeking attention. If they're not getting it at home, they're going to seek it somewhere else. That's infidelity. And the Bible also warns us as men that we need to keep our eyes pure. It's, it's not... Let's not pretend, like just because we're in a Baptist church, that men are just not going to... You need to keep your eyes pure, right? You need to be transparent with your wives. These guys that are like running around with two cell phones and, you know, changing their passwords and stuff, that's how you get in trouble. Because you know what's the other thing, and I, I was thinking about this just right before we, what we got up here, actually, is I was watching, uh, you know, I'm not making fun of you guys. I actually think it's cool, but I was watching. All the guys were gathered around here. They're like, yeah, this is a good piece of wood right here. This is no nice pulpit. Yeah. Like, you know, everyone was like, yeah, when I, 
what did Brother Remy was like, if I slam it right here, it's gonna fly over here. And everybody's like, well, they're really like, oh, I'm a man, this is a great, great pizza. Because I guess we got this other pulpit for Pastor Thompson. <laughs> That's great. I'm glad that there's a bunch of men in here. But you know what? As, as true men of God, you know what the world's going to throw at you? Loose women. You better watch out. Because there's not enough real men in the world. And what do women want? A real man. And so when they notice that you actually take care of you, you know, you're actually in more danger. I, 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 one of the blessings that I have is that I don't have to go to work anymore. I, I used to work at City Hall. And I, had, I mean, I remember coming home and just telling my wife, I met so-and-so, and this lady talked to me. I mean, I was always telling, because they just come on to you. Because they hear stuff like, oh, I, would tell, I, I stopped talking to them about my wife. Because, I mean, it just made it worse. I'm like, oh, yeah, me and my wife went on a date. Oh, that's so sweet. You and your wife went on a date. That's great. You treat your wife so good. And then they just want your attention. And look, if you're not set on the Lord, if you don't have your bearings right, if you don't have your foundation right, you're going to fall for it. You know, these are, you know, marriage is for life. These are four areas that we need to work on. And I know you say, man, you're supposed to preach a marriage, you know, uh, a sermon you seem to be focused on the men because that's the problem we don't have any more men in society we don't have any more leadership in society and what ends up happening is everybody else does what's right in their own eyes your kids are running around tearing up stuff children are you know rebelling all over the place and what are women doing you always hear the two excuses from women that uh, you know I've heard it all my life Hispanic women love to tell you all the excuses to why you know they need to take charge number one well, the husband isn't doing it. My husband doesn't do it, so I have to do it. Look, if your husband's not taking charge and you're frustrated with that, maybe you take it up to the Lord. And I'm not I mean, I don't know. I've never, I don't know any of you guys. I don't know any situation. If that pricks at you, well, then that's probably something you need to fix. Right. Amen. But the other one is because you just might be a little rebellious. Mm. You might need to take a look at what the Lord's trying to do in your life. Instead of always, you know, women, they're a blessing. They nitpick at us and clean us up, but they're also, can, you can also be a little bit too nitpicky. You know what I mean? Sometimes just let your man be a man. Come on. Right? Come on. My, my wife, I remember, go turn to Matthew 5, verse 27, but I remember when we got married, my wife was like, I wish my mom would have told me how disgusting men are. I was like, Thanks, honey. Thanks. And I mean, I shower and everything, but that's how much, <laughs> apparently, apparently we're disgusting. But, but the one thing is she lets me be, right? I mean, apparently she just lets me be disgusting. So there you go. But go to Matthew 5.27, and it says, You have heard that it was said uh, by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, he hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Look, I, I think the reason for infidelity it's because it starts in the mind. I think the reason that you have money problems is it starts in the mind. I think the reason that you, you know, struggle leading is because it starts in the mind. Guard your mind. The reason you don't communicate is because, you know, you, you read, you watch too many manly movies instead of reading the Bible. Right? You watch too much ramble with, like, the one-liners. Hey. Instead of realizing that you actually have to communicate with your wife and teach her something, instead of just saying like one-liners. You watch too many movies that said you had to make, get married older when you had a house and money and everything, instead of just dealing with the consequences of life. It is. I don't care what, how old you are today. I don't care what your situation is today. Tomorrow, it's not going to be the same one. So right now, if you're good, tomorrow it'll be bad. And if it's bad, tomorrow it'll be good. I mean, it really is. Three months ago, if, you, if I would have preached this message, I would have been like, life sucks. I mean, this is tough. <laughs> I really would have. I mean, it was that bad three months ago. Today, life's great. God worked it out. He did it for a reason. But we've got to trust the word of God, and we've got to do it for life. The very first, and the, that's what I'll close out with. Look, don't go into marriage if you have people that are looking to get married or if you're a young couple, but don't be in your marriage to think that some, some day or some point there's an out. Mm. There is no out. Amen. You're in it to win it. Yeah. You're in it for the long haul. Right. I mean, this is it. There is no turning back. Yeah. You burn the bridges, and you got to go forward. 
You know, if, if you wake up and you, you feel that doubt, if you feel, call somebody. You have a great pastor, you have a great church, do it, but don't ever put yourself in that situation because that's where you get in trouble. I mean, really, that's, that's the, the message. If I could say something that's really probably the one thing, because I don't want to pretend like I have a perfect marriage. I, I think I've made that clear today. But the one thing that, that if I could give you one piece of advice is just be honest with your wife. She knows the, the good and the bad. And, you know, I've confessed things that I remember when I was going to get married, and, and that's what I'll close out with. I was going to get married, and I had a really good friend of mine. He's like, don't tell your wife everything. You've got to keep some secrets. And there's some truth to, you know, if it's like a secret that's going to, like, don't put a bad image in her mind or something dumb like that. But overall, just be honest with your, your, your spouse. Yeah. Take care of her. She wants to hear from As a matter of fact, women love all that stuff, right? Just help her out. But that's how you lead, that's how you lead your wife. Give her some, some like, emotional stuff that she... Because it's not like I can call Pastor Thompson and be like, hey, Pastor Thompson, you know, I really need to talk to you about something. <laughs> it's going to like, click. But your wife will listen to you, right? Your wife will listen to you. So anyways, I, I, I didn't want to give, give it... To, I mean, we have two more sermons to preach, and this is supposed to be a light affair, but I love my wife. Love your wives. Lead them. Your wives want you to rule over them. Your wives want you to be benevolent and love them. Your wives want you uh, to take care of them. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to serve you. And they're going to be there for you. And they're going to be a good help me. And they're going to help you through the good and the bad. So let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to preach. Thank you uh, for this great church right here. I was telling my wife on the way over here, I love that it's in the middle of, of like this downtown area, just like a, a big old light that just shines in the Vancouver uh, downtown, Lord, and Lord, I appreciate the opportunity to just be here. I hope it was a blessing, and uh, let's have a, an enjoyable game, game night, and uh, let us not get too rowdy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs>